Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think people may or may not trickle in, but um, praise God for everybody that is, that is here. Um, so uh, my name is Sheree, and I'm going to speak with you all about um, compassionate and empathetic uh, presence in the church, right? Um, and so it says, what's in the house? And um, I, I get tickled every time, um, you know, on Sundays when it comes time to pick gifts, it's talking about giving. And the pastor says, whatever we need is in the house, right? When it comes to our times, our treasures, our talent, um, as long as we do what we're supposed to do, it's in the house. And so it got me thinking as I was kind of putting the presentation together, um, what else might exist in the house? Um, and here's the saying, trouble don't last always, but sometimes trauma stays alive. Yeah. Right, yeah. and so we have to think about what else are people are bringing into the house with them, right? It's just not their gifts. It's just not their presence. Sometimes they're carrying yeah. things that we may or may not know um, that they're, they're struggling with, right? Um, and so that's the, the the basis of this training, and it's a lot of content. So um, if I'm kind of moving quickly through it, uh, please know I'm just trying to make um, you know honor your time and. Um, get kind of all the information in, but I definitely love questions. I definitely love engagement, okay? okay I'm sorry, real quick. Yes, you said trouble don't last always, but trauma lasts a while? Straight trauma might last. My trauma might stay a while. Might stay a while. Um, so the objective of, of today's uh, presentation is that we just grow, um, that we are able to gain an understanding of what sincere empathy and compassion might look like. Um, that we're able to recognize um, what mental health or emotional health issues might look like in the church. Um, that we're um, able to observe and maybe discuss some opportunities to um, express and um, show compassion and empathy to others. Um, and then also, you know, it's always good to have presentations, but then what's next, right? What, are we, what do we do next? How do we move forward? Um, so just to kind of just share just a, a little bit. Um, yes, sir. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Is that acronym on, on any of our documents? No, so with the slides, um, they said if you want them to email them to you. Okay. They yeah, they'll, get, they'll get them at the end of the session. Oh, they will. Okay. So, there you go. Um, so, um, yeah, just a little background history. So, my husband and I came here in July 2022. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of church hurt um, and emotionally depleted. Um, we just needed a safe space to just kind of heal. Um, and so, we came ready to serve. Um, we were committed. We just wanted to do the want to heal, but we were ready to serve. Um, not even a month in, my mother passed away, and you know, as you can imagine, that took me under. Um, it was something that we were, um, you know, she she was battling with cancer, but um, you know, she was in remission for a year, and then she did her annual checkup, and the doctor's response was, "Oh, sorry, actually, it came back at stage four, and you have six months." And so we had to pull it together real quick. Um, and so um, those are things that we brought in. And so there was many a Sundays where, um, you know, I'm going to be honest, I didn't want to be here. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to talk to anybody. My husband literally had to pull me sometimes out of bed to kind of engage with people because I just, I, just, I just wanted to stay in my bed. Um, and so it's situations like these, the stories like these, the struggles like these that people might be bringing with them in the house when we're not aware, right? <laughs> Um, we, we don't maybe, we might not stop and say, how are you doing? Somebody might be looking a certain way and we're like, mm, I ain't going to talk to them, not knowing that what they might have experienced the night before, right? And so having that compassionate and empathetic presence is, is key. And so just going to kind of touch on a couple of these statistics about what's in the house um, when it comes to mental health and emotional health challenges. Um, so it says in one in five adults might experience a mental health illness, right? And so there's what, like six, seven people in here. So at least one of us is struggling with something right now. Um, it says one in 20, is that him? Oh, I was identifying my me as one. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> one in 20 adults will admit to struggling with a serious mental illness. And so what a serious mental illness might look like is suicidal thoughts. Maybe I'm hearing voices. I'm chronically depressed. Um, and if you notice the first part of this, um, just said will admit, right? So that's just what we know. A lot of people suffer in silence. Right, and so I imagine that number is probably a lot higher if, um, if people are um, actually share, sharing what they're going through and or they're aware. Sometimes you go through things that people don't know that they're struggling with depression, so they don't identify. 23% um, of pastors have personally struggled with mental illness. I've heard that, and I think that number might even be a little higher based, um, based off of um, relationships that I, um, yeah. you know, talked to, you know, with people. 
we act. Um, and then it says 20% uh, of individuals believe that their acute mental illness negatively impacts their salvation. Mm -hmm. And so what an acute mental illness is, it's um, maybe somebody's having like a psychotic break. They're starting to hear voices or um, they're having suicidal thoughts and it's um, growing um, intense and being pers it's persistent. Um, because, um, you know, a lot of churches um, don't always make it safe to share that they're struggling with something. Um, people feel like I must be a bad Christian because I'm struggling with these thoughts of suicide. I must be a bad person because um, if my faith was strong, it maybe I wouldn't be depressed. And so they feel like it impacts their salvation and their relationship with God. Um, and people, again, they suffer in silence and you might not ever know that they're sharing these things. Um, and so it's our responsibility as a church to make it safe for people to talk yeah. about these topics because, I mean, with COVID alone, that impacted everybody, mm -hmm. right? And so we can no longer not address the elephant in the room. Mental health is here. It's real. Um, and it, it's, it's felt from the pulpit to the parking lot. Okay. So in you all's experience, if somebody can kind of share with me, what do you feel like the church's response has been to mental health? Not knowing how to respond to it. Not knowing how to respond, yeah. So no response is the response, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Not, and I think it's based on the education in the church. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I would say like church cliches, like name it and claim it, praise your way out of it. Mm -hmm. But some things need financial investment as far as like therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll pray about it. Yeah. That's what the church's response is. We're mm -hmm. gonna be praying for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, uh, um, you know, one of giving you feeling like giving you scripture is gonna solve it. Mm -hmm. You know, oh well, here, you know, here, you know, or telling you to go read scripture, right. and that's gonna take it away. Right. You know, you need to get deeper in your word, or you need to pray more. You know. That, that right. fixed. Right. Yeah. And it goes back to the salvation. Like, I must be a bad person because I'm struggling with this, mm -hmm. right? And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, not here, but sometimes <laughs> they'll escort you to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Wow. If you're sure presenting with mental health, mm -hmm. really? Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's unfortunate. They'll escort you. Escort you off the church. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, and not to say this is bad, but the, the referral might be bad, right? Let me refer you to a deacon or let me refer mm. you to the pastor. Not, not to say that it's not, it's, I'm just saying that it might be, they need a different referral and right. you referring them to the normal, just yeah. standard deacon, pastor, minister, right? Right. And, not be the right, person. Mm. right. and that's, um, you know, being able to use discernment and knowing what's in the house, right? So, do we have some therapists now? Okay. Um, it's against our ethical code. We won't be your personal therapist, but we know the therapist. Right, and so we can always refer you, you know, to people that will be appropriately able to address that that concern. Um, so this says forty nine percent of pastors, um, to your point, they say that they rarely or never speak about mental illness. Um, a lot of times because they feel ill equipped, right? And I get that. Um, I think if you go to seminary, you might have one or two semesters of pastoral counseling. But that's totally different from a ther therapist, right? Um, and it, that would be like asking me to preach a sermon. I'm not equipped to do that, right? But that shouldn't stop me from knowing my word, right? Or knowing how to recognize the signs. And so that's kind of where we're starting where let me be able to kind of maybe recognize what mental illness might look like. And so I can um, make the proper workflow. I know how to help you or um, connect you with somebody that can help you. Um, 90% 90, uh, 90 of pastors provide pastoral counseling, but they don't make the referral. Um, and this is a big one, especially in the black church, because when we're struggling with anything, we're going to go to the church house, right? We're not necessarily going to receive therapy. And so if the pastor's not making it okay for them to say, you know, this might be something that you might need to follow up with mental health services. Let me make that referral. Sometimes they want that okay from their pastor or their leader to do that. Um, and so it's, it's okay to struggle. We're kind of normalizing it, right? It's okay. You don't have to suffer in silence. But then in addition to, to that um, uh, therapeutic referral, mm -hmm. if the Lord brought that person to us, I think our, our continued response should be just loving, Absolutely. just loving and caring and mentoring, mm -hmm. whatever the Lord brings you, but stay in contact with that person. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about what caring the boundaries looks like. 
mm -hmm. right? Um, because we, we don't want to get over our head, right? Because say somebody comes to you and they were sexually assaulted. And, you know, like you said, the Lord brought them to you, but you don't have any experience um, or training to work with somebody like that. Now, that doesn't stop you from, like you said, showing compassion. That doesn't stop you from praying with them, but they need to be connected with somebody that can help them work through that trauma. Because sometimes we unintentionally can cause more damage when we um, step into situations with people, especially has to do with mental health, um, and we don't, we're not fully equipped to do so. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, you talked about uh, pastors not referring. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this is an age old situation, but you're coming to the hospital, which is the church. Mm -hmm. So, where would a pastor, why would he need to refer out? That's mm -hmm. Okay, no, and I, 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 I definitely uh, um, appreciate that comment. Um, and I, I think it's, it's for what I just um, kind of um, highlighted because, you know, pastors are. Um, their, their role is to step into your um, your your needs as far as your faith and your, your you know your spiritual needs right they might not have the training to address the traumas and that puts them in an uncomfortable position because a lot of even pastors don't even realize that they're mandated reporters yeah. and if somebody reporting to you some type of abuse and you don't report it there's legal ramifications for that and so. Um, it, this is really, this is not to shade pastors, this is actually to kind of alleviate them with that burden of having to address all these needs. They have a specific role, but to your point, there's many people in the house that can also meet that need. That's good. Okay. I don't even know who's going to first. I was going to say, so our pastor, he does refer out. So he has, um, he's got a for marriage counseling that he's referred people to different counselors that he has vetted. Mm -hmm. And that he has come So if it gets to a place where, and he, again, he's talking about stuff on his like sermon on the other side, <clears throat> but you know, the discernment will kick in, like, I need to refer this person out. And so he's very good. And I can tell you personally, for Orlando and I, he referred us out to marriage counseling in, in our early years because he was like, okay, I'm going to need y'all to, we, we can talk, but now I'm going to need y'all to go see Dr. Lake and y'all need to hook up with him. And then, uh, you know, then we'll talk to you. Yeah. And so, or even one on one, he'll refer them out if it's like a single individual. So. Yeah, so I was just going to say um, a good connection to that is, uh, you know, Corinthians 12 talks about all the gifts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The pastor, you know what I'm saying? That's his role as overseer. And I think, as you well say, you know, his job is to manage that spiritual mm -hmm. guidance in, in our faith. But at the same time, as Ms. Mellon said, you know, discernment. Okay, well, this is, you know, it could, it, we're talking about mental, but what if it's financial? Well, the pastor may not be a financial advisor, That's true. but in that conversation, compassion, mm -hmm. and counseling, mm -hmm. he discerns, oh, you need to go speak to a financial advisor. Right. He's right. going to refer you to the gifts of the body. Everything we need is in the house. Mm -hmm. So now that we've identified who's in this space, so we have mm -hmm. therapists in the space, we have financial advisors, mm -hmm. we have, you know, in the space, now let me connect you with where the Holy Spirit is working, you know, primarily right. as their gift mm -hmm. in that space. Now I'm still going to oversee. Right. I'm going to have you come back and we're going to connect and mm -hmm. see how it's going, right? Just, you know, when we do marriage counseling, like Mel said, he still want to talk with us. Right. It ain't like he just right. turned us over. Right. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? But he's now yielding to the gift mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit put in the individuals that, that cover that, that, that's in that space. Absolutely. So let me ask you, um, because this comes up a lot, especially in this black church, um, because we do over spiritualize a lot, right? Yes. And so if somebody's having a heart attack, would you refer them to the pastor? <laughs> no. Would you call the doctor? 911. Right. And so it's the same thing with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Therapists are just mental health doctors, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's we, we always have this discussion in therapist circles because it, it's so like, you know, and I get it taboo, especially in the ch black church and black communities, mental health. I'm not crazy. It's, it's an illness. Depression is an illness like anything else. And so let me connect you with somebody who uh, works specializes in mental health that can address that illness, just like a doctor. Okay. Um, what does compassion mean? Mm. Mm. Like Understanding. Understanding, you know, being able to relate. 
Is there a difference between compassion and empathy? Yes. So there's empathy is like, um, uh, it's, you, you understand, but you empathize with someone because they're going through something. Mm -hmm. um, compassion is like, you're understanding and you just need to, to greet them with a, the with a, uh, understanding of love mm -hmm. to show them that you care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sympathy, of course, you know, it's all of those that empathy, sympathy, and compassion. I can't explain. We have the, we have the definition you about to show us? Yeah. Please, yeah. We'll go to it right now. So um, basically, compassion is love and action, mm -hmm. right? Um, so these are kind of the four responses um, that somebody um, will generally receive um, by someone when they're struggling. Um, the first one is really just the bare minimum, pity, right? So say you have a friend that comes to you and they say, Hey, sis, I'm about to get a divorce. And your response is, ooh, I feel bad for you. Mm. And that's it. There's no connection. There's no acknowledging the suffering. Um, divorce, that's that's a traumatic thing for a lot of people. That's another form of grief and loss, right? And so if your response is, I just feel, I feel sorry for you and it goes nowhere else, that's not enough. You have to push a little further. Mm. Sympathy gets a little better because at least you're acknowledging that they're suffering, right? And so an example of this would be um, when um, you know someone passes away. What is our response? We send a, a condolence. I send our condolences. We send a card, thinking of you, praying for you, right? And so um, we're acknowledging that there's some suffering, and then we're sending our thoughts and our prayers with that person. That's good. Cool. Mm -hmm. Empathy it goes a little further, and this is when I really this really starts to get good because this is the connection piece. This takes connection. Um, somebody may have just got a cancer diagnosis or lost a loved one um and you might say well i've never received a cancer diagnosis but you know what it's like to be sick right you know the stress that comes with being sick um you know i guarantee you probably lost a loved one it might be a spouse but you know what it's like to grieve right and so i might not understand or have um, experienced exactly what you are experiencing but i know what i'm, I'm empathizing with the feeling that you're, you're sharing with me okay um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna address it there. Says, let me call you. Is it okay if I call you? Is it okay if I check on you? Yeah. Um, it goes past just sending a card. We're constantly following up with that person. Mm -hmm. um, and the compassion is the ultimate goal. Um, it's when you're like you said, Linda, you're stepping into it with that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this takes relationship. Okay. Maybe somebody just lost their spouse, even though they have young children. So maybe that means you are um, going to take the children to school. Or maybe you're helping um, clean up the house or cook, cooking meals. Um, it's love in action. Okay. Any questions about these responses? I had a grandmother that uh, was transitioning, mm -hmm. and her she was uh, 87, I think. And so uh, when I went out to visit them in a different state, I was asked to go pick up my cousin. Mm -hmm. So the cousin was downtown, and. Mm -hmm. We didn't, I never knew her, but I just went and picked her up and brought her back to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother at the time was still talking. You know, she was still talking. Mm -hmm. What did she do? Mm -hmm. But as soon as cousin came into the house, I watched her for like maybe eight hours say nothing. Mm -hmm. She just held her hand. And they held hands for eight hours and sat there. And I think that's a part of love and action. Mm -hmm. I can't do, but I can be here. For, mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Presence, absolutely. Presence is the um, underrated gift, right? Just sitting with somebody would mean a whole lot because ultimately, when you're showing compassion to somebody, you're telling them that they're not alone and what they're struggling mm -hmm. with, right? And that can look like mm -hmm. you said, just sitting by somebody's Jeez. bedside. Wow. That can look like showing up and cooking a meal, but again, it takes relationship, right? If you might not have a personal relationship with somebody, but you know somebody does, and say, hey, how can I help? Mm -hmm. um, one thing with compassion I want to highlight, so. Um, you know, I was the first amongst my friend group to have lost a parent. And so I, we're just having these conversations now with my friends. Um, and they said, we didn't know how to show up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we do it so often um, when we find out somebody loses someone and we text them and say, so sorry for your loss. Speaking of you, let me know what I can do. The last thing that somebody wants to do when they're experiencing a grief and loss is to come up with a to-do list yes. mm -hmm. for you to do something. <laughs> and so again, it takes relationship 
um, to know how to step in. And it's uncomfortable. You know, Pastor talked about it the other day. It's ministry is not comfortable. Sometimes you have to sacrifice some things. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone and step in that with them. Now you want to pray about it and use discernment because mm -hmm. we're just not going to be doing all type of crazy, you know, type of thing that we're trying to help, but it's just it, it causes kind of chaos sometimes. Um, but just being willing to kind of step into that moment with that person so they don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's uh, the relationship part is the key. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a friend and uh, he said something to me mm -hmm. and he, he was like, whatever it was, the whatever the response is, I says, I need to know our level of relationship. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but if you're telling us we're going to this level now, we still got to have that communication because I can't assume I can be doing whatever. But if you're telling me we have that relationship and you're giving me permission, mm -hmm. then yes, I will love on you according to what you're sharing. Right. You right. can make it sense. It could be any scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we sometimes don't know the level. Right. You know, right. Um, I had a loss too. And I seen people show up that I had not seen. And all they wanted to do was sit with them. And that was that meant a lot. Mm -hmm. I, you're right. Nobody wants to have a, a. Let me think about how I can have them help. Right, right. You're not thinking about it. You know, you probably don't even have your head on straight, right? Um, and so I want to um take a, a moment. We'll just break up in two groups. Um, so just these these two, this table and this table. Um, and we're gonna take a moment to just kind of walk through the scriptures. Um, and I'm gonna give you um. A parable for each table and I just want you to kind of point out what things kind of pop out to you whether it's signs of compassion whether it's empathy pity um, whatever kind of pops out to you um, just kind of talk about it amongst your group and then we're going to kind of uh, come back and kind of report out so for, this will be group one um, the the scripture that you will be assigned to uh, the good Samaritan um, and so somebody in this group you guys come together Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 30. Is it on any of these documents? No, no it's going to be, yeah, they, they didn't print them. Really? <laughs> I'm going to give you guys, this is not you guys, you got to go to Luke 10. Luke 10, chapter, uh, yeah, Luke 10, verses 25 to 37, that's this group. So you're going to be discussing the Good Samaritan and any signs of compassion or empathy in that story, or lack thereof. Um, and this group, we're going to talk about um, Jesus raises Lazarus. So your scripture would be John 11, 1 through 44. I apologize, it's a lot of verses. But <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, just um, discuss it amongst, yeah. And then your group, so you're with, you'll be with them. Okay. Yeah, and then this group right here, you're probably going to be discussing the good thing. Just take a couple minutes to do that and then we'll come back together and share. Oh, I'm reading. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, let's come. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. Bible scholars are ready to go. So that's the Samaritan. Where the man was beaten and robbed mm -hmm. and left him inside the room. What are we looking for? Priest one. Um, Identify which one is important. Um, compassion or whatever you see, whatever pops out, but are there signs of compassion and signs of pity? Yeah. Yeah. Different um, nationalities mm -hmm. or religions or something. Right. It's just one thing. No, no, no. Just go ahead. You, you got it. I'm, I'm just following what you read. I'm following. I'm with you. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah. Chose the honor. 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 
Okay, so the beginning of it, the 25, was the one and the man who asked Jesus what must he do to be saved to inherit eternal life? Right? And Jesus says,
credit. Um, <laughs> um, empathy from, from the man who um, took in the other men that had been beaten and left on the road when everybody passed him by. Mm -hmm. Um, the Good Samaritan showed a lot of empathy because um, he took him in, he cleaned him up himself. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just look at him and feel sorry for him. Mm -hmm. He, um, you know, he felt compassion and then he felt empathy because he did something mm -hmm. for him, washing him up, cleaning him up and everything and bandaging him. And then he paid for his room and board. And, mm -hmm with the, the owner of the inn and, and told him, you know, just take care of it, I'll, I'll pay the bill. Mm -hmm. And that is empathy because he, he didn't do it looking for praise from anyone. In fact, it was outside of being praised worthy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, ju he just took care of him without the thought of receiving something in return. Mm -hmm. So I think it's switched a little bit. So it's more so he showed more compassion. Mm -hmm. Um, because he stepped into it with her. Um, but you're absolutely right. And we both of them, it was very evident there. Um, everybody else kind of walked past him. Those you felt like she would have stood up and said something and helped. Right. Yeah. Yes. She spoke to the group? She did. Oh, okay. <laughs> and she spoke very well. Yes. Yeah. What about group two? Um, so thank you for that. Um, group two, um, Jesus raises Lazarus. What came out of... Um, that terrible for you. Three out of four. <laughs> well, we, we we identified some of the verses. Okay. So one of them was verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. So we stepped into that. And then eleven, this he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. But I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. So, you know, being present. And um, 16, therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Mm -hmm. And 19 was, um, 18 and 19, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a lot of felt, a lot of feeling. And he weeps with them. Yeah. Right? He weeps with them. Anybody else want to go? Um, so, uh, just continuing on, the Jews um, often they refer to the Jews who are comforting Mary and Martha. So, they were present, as Nicole said. So, a lot of uh, that empathy. Uh, it's feeling another person's pain, um, mm -hmm. sympathy, acknowledging and, and action because mm -hmm. um, they were present. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think Christ is going to provide compassion mm -hmm. because he not only became present, he not only acknowledged, but he also, um, as you put it earlier, shared in, in the, in the, the load of the suffering mm -hmm. to the point of, you know, uh, demonstrating his authority over life and death. Absolutely. Yeah. Operating his gift of healing too. Gift of healing. Right? right. Um, thank, thank you, uh, group two. Um, well, we're going to talk about it a little further, but um, boundaries and caring, right? So when you think about this scripture, when they brought it to Jesus, he didn't rush to the aid, right? He used discernment. He knew what was going to take place. Um, and he kind of took his time, but when he was there, he was there, right? He was there emotionally. He, you know, he wept, he wept with them. And so um, he... He didn't, and he did it unapologetically, right? He didn't um, do it asking anything in return. They even tried to say, well, if you were here, this wouldn't happen, mm -hmm. right? They tried to place his blame. Yeah. Um, but he knew who he was in that moment and what his, his assignment was. He was clear on that, right? Um, and so what are some verbal and nonverbal ways to show compassion and empathy? Um, one of the, the main ways, and it kind of really starts here as far as reflective listening. So when we're engaging in reflective listening, um, when you're reflecting something, you're mirroring, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that could look like is, I'm saying, hey, I'm really struggling with anxiety. Like, um, my, my, I'm having racing thoughts. Um, I am having um, trouble kind of caring for the baby. And so what you say, it sounds like what I'm hearing is you're, you're struggling with some anxiety, and you might need help with maybe child care and services. 
and either say yes that's it or no that's not it and we kind of have this back and forth dialogue until I'm clear on what you're saying, the message you're delivering, and I'm clear on my understanding, right? Because if you don't know what somebody's asking, if we're so quick to move and we don't know really what the ask is, we might be missing it, right? So we want to engage in reflective listening. Um, and then another big one is minding your tone and your tongue. Oh. Right? Um, people, uh, what they say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? And then uh, this one saying, I don't even know where it came from because it's not true. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. So that is a lie. They words, they probably hurt more than sticks and stones because they stick with you. Yeah, I was say they last long. Yes, <laughs> right? Well, I said trouble might last um, over trouble, and that's always the trouble might stick a while, right? And so being really mindful of what we say. And um, and I think we kind of stick our foot in our mouths a lot of times because uh, I think somebody mentioned we don't necessarily understand. Um, we might not know what mental health really looks like. And so we say things, and sometimes it's unintentional, but we just want to be mindful of what we're saying, especially when people um, are struggling, right? Yes, I may. Yes, you may. <clears throat> so like before when we were talking about um, how the church mm -hmm. sometimes turns people away uh -huh. or get them like that are dealing with mental illness yeah. and the way that they handle things. What I meant by that is like, you know, there are regulars who come and they already know their MO, they mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And so that person may stray away, they go and then they come back. Mm -hmm. I've just witnessed how that has happened. So that's why I said mm -hmm. that they will sometimes just escort them off the premises and like call me or say, you know, let's schedule an appointment, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Have mm -hmm. you ever been experienced that? experienced that or been put in a position where um, you were, someone offended you in a manner where you thought they would have understood, but they misinterpret your, your, your words mm -hmm. and how you came off? All the time. Okay. All, all the time. But, you know, and I think that's what goes back to being in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you get to know people's like personality. Um, like maybe this person seems a little off or it seems a little distant today. And I know this isn't your normal MO, but you know, that scripture, if you're offended by something your brother or sister says, you go to them. You don't go to all talk about the problem with all these other people and you don't address it with that. Right. Um, so clearly stating what your intentions and limitations are. Sometimes um, you know, we, we have every intent to help and go above and beyond, but we just don't really have the bandwidth or the capacity. Um, to step into that role uh, with that person at that time. So you say, hey, I, I might not be able to take your kids every week, but I can cook dinner maybe once or twice. You know, just being clear. Um, and sometimes things change, we get it, but just at least communicating that and don't leaving that person kind of in, um, in need. They've already opened up to you that, you know, they're struggling and then if they reach out and then you're just not available, that can cause more hurt and harm to that person. Um, and you know, nonverbal eye contact, relaxing your face. Um, so that I, this is something I'm working on. You know, I definitely have that resting face at times, um, but just being more approachable, right? You know, people, you never know what somebody's going through. And even in, in my resting face, my husband tells kind of makes me mindful of it, but a lot of times I'm still in my head, right? I'm right. thinking about, you know, it has nothing to do with you or anything where I'm at, I'm just in my head. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it takes somebody to be like, you know, come fix your face, but you're not looking too pleasant right now. So just be mindful of how um, you, you come you come across. And then not be offended if somebody does have a face. I think we're so easily offended too, mm -hmm. right? Um, we take offense to everything. So what are some things that cause people not to show empathy or compassion? What would, what would you guys say? What would stop somebody um, from receiving um, empathy or compassion? Receiving or giving? Receiving. A person's response, um, they're, if they are fake, mm -hmm. if it doesn't seem like it's authentic, mm -hmm. um, past um, negative comments, talking mm -hmm. behind the back, and then they find out something mm -hmm. like, oh, now all of a sudden you come in yeah. and you want to act like you're being compassionate and empathetic and you understand my situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'll kind of clarify a little bit. So one of the examples I gave is the mental health stigma in the church and black communities. Because, um, you know, it's still very taboo in the circles that we run in. Um, because I don't understand or recognize you to be actually experiencing depression, I'm not going to show you compassion. Because I don't, I don't really believe that mental health is a thing, right? 
Um, and sometimes people feel like they need to know all the details of what you're going through in order for them to show love. Right. And sometimes uh, um, the, the mental health part looks normal to people because that's how they grew up. And it's like, right. you know, no wow. big thing. And, or, or mental health is really, you got you have to be acting crazy or paranoid or, you know, rather than, you know, dealing with the trauma inside your, your mind and your body. Right. It's a, it's a lack of knowledge. Like you said, people think mentally ill, you got to be crazy. And that's certainly a form of it, but that's more of a severe form. People can be um, functionally depressed. Meaning, I'm still going to work every day, but when I go home, I'm in bed. Right. Um, I gave the example earlier when my mother passed, like I showed up for Sunday, but I didn't want to be here. I wasn't mentally here. Right. Um, so I think I saw. Yeah. I was like, I'm just sitting here and I'm recognizing the level of importance, and even what we've addressed so far between the four segments. Mm -hmm. and one of our responsibilities as, as ministers, deacons, is to play a role in the congregation in the worst time. Responsibility. Um, I don't think we could. I, I know for me, I can only speak for myself. I didn't know the difference of what I was doing when I'm making this phone call or trying to, you know, touch the parishioner and all that. I could have been doing pity. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Um, instead of showing either empathy or compassion and knowing how to discern at what, you know, well, hey, pity don't even need to be on the list. You know what I'm saying? That's a recognized one. But if I need to show, which one do I need to show at this time? Is it sympathy, empathy, combination? You know what I'm saying? How far into sharing this load do I need to go based on what I'm communicating, what it's been communicating to me? But now I have a better sense of discerning. And even when it's, okay, it's so heavy, let me get care and concern in here. Let me get pastor involved. You know what I'm saying? Now using the gifts because they have released something to me that now I can bring to, the, to those who are gifted in that space. And then we got started here, right? To grow, right? These are all things that um, we may have experienced and we didn't know how to address it. Um, but the important thing is just making it safe mm -hmm. and recognizing that it, it is here. Um, and so now what do we do? What's our response? Okay. Yeah, um, also like in the church, uh, I, I heard this time and time again. Oh, just, you need to suck it up. You didn't die oh. on the cross. <laughs> so whatever you're going through, mm -hmm. it's not above that. So. Right, mm -hmm. right. So that's, you know, you you go on ahead in the, in the PowerPoint, the church cliches. We over-spiritualize a lot. And it can be very that's dismissive. Yeah. Very dismissive to people who are really struggling. Um, um, you know, when we first got uh, Sammy, we got him right around Mother's Day. And so that was my first Mother's Day without my mom. And so it was, you know, very difficult for me. And I had people really passing judgment of, you know, you just got this new baby. Like, what? What do you have to be mad about? And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, okay. And like, those are one of the moments you just kind of bite your tongue, right? And I understood, you know, why they're, you know, he's a blessing, absolutely. But um, mourning and joy can exist at the same time, mm. and we have to be able to allow again people to um, shift to to rest in that, and we don't want to keep them there. Um, but we we don't want to also make them feel ashamed to be struggling with something um, and they don't want to share it because it's not safe. They're going to feel judged yeah. for experiencing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Can I also? Yes. Um, you know, the question will call me not to show empathy. I think uh, sometimes we choose who we empathize with based on the outer appearance of the person. So mm -hmm. if the person has a history of being like angry or mean mm -hmm. or aggressive, but they suffer loss by, oh, well, it's kind of like, well, that's what she did, or she mean. Mm -hmm. So if I go up to him or, him or her to show empathy, are they even going to receive it? You know, mm -hmm. and that's not really us to to, to judge or to decide. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a heart, of, you're supposed to have a heart of God, so you're supposed to extend that grace mm -hmm. and that love and that joy towards mm -hmm. that person. But I think we're so um, concerned about um, what the, pers the, the person's reaction is. Mm -hmm. If we don't feel the person's going to react a certain way, it may limit us on on our own actions, as far as like being obedient and stepping out and extending that uh, compassion. Absolutely. We become the judge of the who deserves it and who doesn't. Yeah. Right? And that is not our role. You know, yeah. and it's also not our role to, I see you there, um, uh -huh. to um, change people's hearts. So um, this example was actually brought up in the last class about 
um, somebody had a coworker and they're just not approachable and they're just mean. Um, and they really, they recognize that nobody talks to this person. Um, and so she stepped up and just started saying kind of things, acknowledging them. And that took, um, that's what it took to kind of break, break the hardening of that person's heart because somebody extended an olive branch and showed love and compassion. And that's what they needed, right? And so it does, again, it's, some, it's not always comfortable. Um, you know, we're called to love. We don't always have to like, we don't always like everybody that we're ministry with, right? But again, we're supposed to love everybody. Sometimes people don't um, show empathy, compassion, and kindness what? because they feel like they're just too strong. You've got it all mm -hmm. under control. You don't mm -hmm. need it. Mm -hmm. You carry yourself a certain way. Mm -hmm. She got it. She knows what to do. So they feel inferior to where they don't even want to ask you how you're doing. Mm -hmm. They just give you a nice little smile, a little pat, mm -hmm. and they're gone on their way and they think they've done it. But they don't realize, you know, a couple of kind words or I see you, I mm -hmm. hope all is well. Mm -hmm. Small, short, sweet. Yeah. Kind of helps. Yeah. Prayer words. They need, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And especially being ministry leads, you know, sometimes you get hit the hardest, mm -hmm. right? And people don't see that. They just always bring their things to you. Not recognizing, I got things of my own about this. It's the you dump. Know? It's the dump. Yes. When they continue to you. come and dump. Absolutely. And you wonder who's pouring into you mm -hmm. after you listened and you um, prayed and you shared and mm -hmm. even given scripture and, yeah. you know, you've acknowledged what you've heard. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, they're feeling better sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then you have to sit back and go, you know, refill your cup. Yeah, that's I had that happen to me one time. I was trying to um, explain to my sister how I was feeling and what I was going through, and she just said, "Stop! Stop. Nope, nope. I don't want to hear it because I'm like the 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 rock of the family, so to speak. Yeah, and helping everybody through whatever and everything. And and when that happened to me, it was like. Oh, I just like I wanted to fall to the ground and just cry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, people don't realize it, you know. But it, it, she was basically saying, "No, because if you're sick, then where am I going to get my help from?" Mm -hmm. and, that's, mm -hmm. and it might have been unintentional, but it didn't cost selfish for that. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have things that we're struggling with, and so if I can't come share with you, but you want to share with me all the time, um, those boundary issues, and then now I feel like you're taking advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that can build resentment and bitterness and a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, have you guys heard of the term compassion fatigue? Mm -hmm. Fatigue. I've compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so, what this is, is basically you want to care, but you just don't have it in you. Mm -hmm. Because, and it, it, it's... Yeah. Yes. You're exhausted, mm -hmm. right? Um, again, it, it's with uh, leaders, it's with um, nurses, doctors, therapists. We are constantly, you know, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 pastors. Um, you're constantly hearing other people's trauma, stress, burdens. Um, and sometimes, again, it's not a lack of wanting to, it's just, I just can't hear another, I can't hear another sad story. I don't want to attend another funeral. I, you know, and it's just good. It, it's it's real, and it, I I understand the shame behind it, but again, it goes back to making it safe for people to share what they're really going through. Um, and then, really, a lot of people don't know they're experiencing it, so being able to um, allow them to identify what it is, like, oh, that's what that was, right? It wasn't that I was having a heart, 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 and heart. I'm just I'm I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. And not taking yeah. care of yourself. I'm sorry. Yes. Not mm -hmm. taking care of yourself. Yeah, I'll get into yeah. that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Right. <laughs> and I know we're trying to get through it, but I, I really like this because, um, and let's go back to what Ms. Emma was saying, is that, you know, when my bucket is being filled up with everybody else's traumas and trials mm -hmm. and tribulations, now I got a full bucket. Where am I dumping it? Exactly. You know, we're, we're, you know, my bucket is full. Mm -hmm. My cup is empty, but my bucket is full. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know my cup gets filled up by the Holy Spirit, right? right. The Holy Spirit's going to refill my cup. But where I dump this bucket at? Right. Because I still got people pouring in. And if I don't dump the bucket, then it's going to overflow. Mm -hmm. And I want my cup to overflow, not the bucket. Right, right. Yeah, and that's messy, right? Literally. Yeah. It gets messy. <laughs> it gets messy. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the signs, um, but these are just some um, signs that kind of um, stick out as far as um, signs of compassion and fatigue. So 
physically, people might just withdraw. They might be very isolated, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, this is also a symptom of depression, but it doesn't necessarily have to be depression. They just need some time to steal away. Mm -hmm. Jesus did, right? The garden of he just needed some time just to kind of be with him and God. Um, he was dealing with a lot. He knew what was to come, and he just needed time. He just needed a breather. Um, what it might look like emotionally, you're irritable. Um, Mr. Corey talked about bucket overflowing. So now you're spewing anger on other people mm. because you don't have anywhere. It's, it's displaced anger. Mm. You're overloaded and you're overwhelmed and you don't know how to get it out. Um, you can become aggressive. Um, you can become defensive. Sometimes we're very defensive in our response, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm. What are some things that you guys might see as now that we understand what compassion fatigue is, some things that you might have seen, you saw, experienced, and recognizing now, like, oh, maybe that's what that was. I know exactly. I went <laughs> through, I tapped out. I was like, I'm disappearing. <laughs> Call the phone is ringing. I text real quick and say, hey, hope all is well. I'll check in with you a little bit later. I had to just remove myself because mm -hmm. I realized and I didn't know that there was a such thing as compassion fatigue but literally they were draining me dry it was like oh my goodness you know when the phone ring and you see the name come up you're like <laughs> that's what I was experiencing and I did not know that there was a such thing as compassion yeah. fatigue and now I know now I can yes it's happened. Yes, Anybody. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it was. Anybody else on that? No, I want to point out um, what intellectual compassion fatigue might look like. And again, this is common with leader. Um, you feel like I could have done more, yeah. right? Especially when it comes to maybe somebody passing away, like a caregiver might say, I could have, if I would have did this, maybe I should have did that. Mm -hmm. um, and that is guilt and that's not a fact you know you know mm -hmm. we're not we don't want to operate in shame um mm -hmm. and so that that's you know a sign of being this maybe there was some boundaries crossed where you're over exerting yourself mm -hmm. and um as a result you're feeling guilty about whatever the outcome was and can that also happen like you know you mentioned boundaries it's like when you don't set boundaries to preserve the relationship then you do unintentionally become fatigued because mm -hmm. you want to try so much or when mm -hmm. you, you pour 100% into one person and you help them then you like oh I got to put on a cake I got to go get 50,000 other people and do the same thing because it happened mm -hmm. and then you don't realize that you burn everything you have physically emotionally financially mm -hmm. and then your hair is gone and now you're <laughs> sick and, okay. and, and now you know now you're on the other side right. you know and because you know you know, you didn't set the boundary. Right. You know, you mm -hmm. and it's and it's important to operate within mm -hmm. uh, your realm or your your gift, you mm -hmm. know, your talents. You know, don't don't try and be a doctor if you're if you're a carpenter. You know. I'm sorry. I like what he said. Um, <laughs> but then, too. You know, <laughs> right? Like I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't like it like that. Um, but sometimes you have set boundaries, and when you're in a relationship for so long. Their expectations are so high of you that you have to go back in a circle to remind them of the boundaries that were set previously. It's almost like they get amnesia. They forgot. I don't like being called boo. I am not your boo, your boo boo, your boo. You don't call me that. That's not my name. I love the name Linda. That's a that's sufficient. I'll do sis. I'll do sweetie sometimes, but boo, 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 boo. I hope you can hear this. Please stop calling me boo. I don't like it. Okay. I do not. And I say that with love. I say that because of relationship yeah. and in the most compassionate way. The boundaries are set. Sometimes they forget and they go into expectations knowing because you have history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they don't have to abide by those boundaries that were set from the no. beginning so then you have to go back around in a circle and remind people of what you expect of them as well mm -hmm. i'm sorry i'm not gonna say oh, anything okay. today no, you're anymore. i appreciate that 
Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, because I, I think that that is um, key. Sometimes in relationships, you just get comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, people mm -hmm. forget um, there's even boundaries in relationships. And so I even had to tell a friend one time because she was showing up in a way that I didn't ask and it was actually becoming more of a, a burden on me. And I said, you know, boundaries don't have to be understood, but they shouldn't be straight. Yeah. That's Ooh. good. You know, yeah. and it, we have to have a heart to heart conversation about it. But boundaries, I think they get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a negative thing. Now, you could use it negatively. Mm -hmm. You know, people ghost you or they stonewall you, go into silent treatment. Um, that would be a negative form of a boundary. Yeah. But sometimes, and we, we're working through it, right? <laughs> but sometimes, um, you know, boundaries preserve relationships. Mm -hmm. They let you know where you're comfortable and where you're not comfortable. Um, and you can communicate that to others that you're in relationship. Um, and so it says, what are some ways that we can avoid compassion fatigue? Um, and I think I actually like you spoke on this because I don't know if it's 100% um, avoidable all the time. Um, simply because we are in ministry, sometimes there's seasons where we do have to go above and beyond. Um, some seasons we have to grind, um, but again, it's a season, right? And that's a, between you and God of how long that season is. But um, there's a cutoff time and there's a start time. And so it's important for us as um, in the church um, and families with really any dynamic to be able to set those healthy boundaries. And so what that could look like is clearly defining what an emergency is. Um, some people are okay with getting called at three o'clock in the morning. Some people are like, don't disturb my sleep, right? So if that's the case, communicating that. Um, clearly communicating uh, what your Sabbath days are. Um, my husband and I, there was a moment where we, only, we both only had Sundays off together. And so that was our time, our couple time. So we didn't do anything else with anybody else. That was our time to kind of pour into each other. Um, avoiding dual relationships. Um, this one is really, do you have anything? No. Oh, okay. Um, this one is key, um, especially as ministers, leaders. Um, you know, we shared that, you know, you're going to have people coming to you and emotionally dumping on you all the time. It is your role and your responsibility as the, the authoritative figure in that dynamic to set and maintain healthy boundaries. Um, and that's important because, you know, if you have somebody emotionally dumping on you and you're emotionally dumping on them, sometimes the lines get blurred and it's like, who's helping you, right? Um, and so you can do that with love, you do that with compassion, but you need to be clear. Um, sometimes, uh, I can't, you, you know, if you're giving too much attention to one person and you're ignoring another person's need, you need to kind of be mindful of that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, uh, everybody mentioned that uh, we're so fortunate to have a pastor that does things outside of church. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think he goes to concerts and mm -hmm. his, the first lady. They're doing other things mm -hmm. that, that would minister to me mm -hmm. because they're living their life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, instead of being in the office and taking phone calls every yep. five minutes and you know trying to solve everyone's problems. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a blessing mm -hmm. that, that I see, you know, as a married man, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, and a great example that um, you know, yeah, he has his time mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. which is, you are all up to do my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I love so, it. That means it's confirmation mm -hmm. because I, I love that. That's what Drew um what me and my husband actually noticed too. Because, you know, it's no doubt that they're in ministry together. They're here. You know, they're serving. But they're going to go on their trip, right? They're going to go see their family. And that's important. You have to have balance. Yeah. Ministry that's is overwhelming. Balance. Ministry is hard. You have to have that balance. And so, um, you know, having people, accountability people that can kind of point out, hey, sis, or hey, brother, you you kind of, you're out of whack right now. You might be doing a little too much. Letting them know, Right. Um, and having a trusted circle. You know, Jesus had the 12 disciples, but he also had three that were his main, right? And so having that as a leader is important because they're going to be able to recognize um, those things that are under the armor that other people don't have access to. And I think we're we're all done. It was so good. I know. I apologize. Um, but um, Minister Marilyn said they will make the slides available. Yes. Okay. Um, and so if you have any questions, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and um, I just thank you guys for the time. I hope something was said that kind of stuck with you. Um, and maybe, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so maybe we can circle back and have another discussion to see what happens.